so I am everlastingly being told that being a centrist, I am a fence-sitter. I cannot commit. I am wishy-washy. So I thought I would address this. Because you see, to my mind, I am not the fence-sitter. Most of you are. For most of the time, you are out there quarrelling about matters left and right. And there, indeed, I am the centrist. I cannot mobilise that much passion over tax rates, unionisation, or healthcare. You can. But then it comes to free speech, free expression. This is a territory in which I have been in the walls. I have the scars to show for it. And here you, the people out there, are mostly the fence-sitters. Yes, you. I remember years ago, many years ago, I was writing to government departments, writing to ministers, responding to public consultations on legislation, and so on. Why? Because I felt someone needed to try. Someone needed to make the case, however hopeless the situation may have been. Where were you? Well, there is a good chance that you were still in short trousers, or that you were just blissfully unaware of the growing threat, or frankly that you didn't care, because you were too busy fighting about matters of the political left or right. As with every hopeless cause, I eventually grew weary. I staged my own forms of rebellion against the increasingly evil system of censorship and control, but sooner enough I fell silent, simply having been ground down. Eventually I joined this YouTube bandwagon as I saw, at last, a vehicle through which one might voice dissent and reach people. Of course, most of the dialogue seems to be about calling left-wingers cucks or libtards, or complaining about the lamestream media. Anyone who does not do so in the aforementioned fashion is a fence-setter. Hence I fit the description, apparently. But here's the thing. I found myself defending Stefan Molyneux in a tweet over the Christmas period from one of these new additions to the YouTube commentariat, who happens to be doing very well because he looks much like a member of the latest boy band. I pick this case at random, but it's a fairly good example. I am no great fan of Stefan Molyneux's. Frankly, he blocked me on Twitter once my questions seemed to his mind to have grown too impertinent. But here I was nonetheless opposing someone who was calling for everyone to block Stefan Molyneux, for something that Stefan Molyneux had dared to say. Evidently it was the wrong thing he had said, and thus something he ought never be able to say again. So block him, why don't you? As per usual, I didn't get overwhelming support in my opposition to this, as the one I was opposing was cute and apparently cool whatever that is, whereas I clearly am neither. Thus, it is fair to say, as long as the one you oppose is sufficiently attractive and popular, resistance always proves so much harder. Suddenly all those determined social media trench war fighters in the battles over whether Hitler was a socialist have better things to do. Or to put it in a way they might better comprehend, they sit on the fence. The one they're being asked to criticise is prettier than them. Oh dear. Thus, it is so much easier for them instead to how do they always put it, to cuck to him. In that regard, there is a great deal of cucking, a great deal of weakness all round. This last year saw the issue of lolly comics come to the fore. Now I understand why a company like Gab, which is beset from all sides and needs to make sure it remains within the law, would see fit to ban it. To my mind, they had little choice. But what I objected to was the intellectual weakness being shown by many who simply conceded to the ground or even went out of their way to champion the prohibition of this material. These people divided into two camps. Those who in this material saw the drawn depiction of fictional underage sex and started shrieking in disgust, and those who saw it as a matter of optics, who decided this could not be the hill on which to die. Either camp is completely wrong. The first are devoid of principle, keen to claim they support free speech until such a time as they come up against something of which they do not approve and the other are as naive to believe the opposing side will ever choose a ground to do battle on which it is easy to oppose them. Now, sure, it is not the hill on which to die, but it is nonetheless the hill to which you at least stake a claim. You must provide at least some verbal resistance. If you claim that you can watch murder and fornication without it affecting you negatively, if you claim you can hear far-right people speak and not succumb to hate, then you cannot claim that something entirely fictional in nature, must be banned because it might corrupt other people. Your discomfort and the discomfort of others whom you might hope to persuade on other fronts counts for nothing. To quote Ben Shapiro, I don't care about your feelings. 
Of course, many of you, including the aforementioned Mr. Shapiro, prefer to talk about hypothetical apples and hypothetical pears being traded on hypothetical islands in hypothetical models trying to explain hypothetical free market economics. Because to you it's all about the right and the left. Or about the NHS, whereby either side largely backs the system they know. Americans telling the British they ought to go private, and the British insisting the Americans ought to adopt a public system. Either camp rejecting out of hand any suggestion they ought to abandon the system they presently have. As someone who has experienced both a private insurance system and a public system, I cannot muster much enthusiasm to do battle in this sphere, as so many of you can. Most likely because I have seen both in operation, and neither is a catastrophe nor a nirvana in which no problems exist. But you see, my prime concern of preserving free expression supersedes your exercises in macroeconomic pedantry. Yes, you can go on quarrelling about Democrat, Republican, Labour or Tory economic policies to your heart's delight, if your right to do so remains secure. But it is your very right to do so that is close to my heart. And on that, unlike most of you, I am not a fence-sitter. I am much more determined. I am much more clear-sighted on this issue than most of you out there. For most of you don't admire decisiveness as much as you think. You admire it in those who champion the subjects you hold dear. Apples and pears and islands and so on. And those who fail to show such decisiveness and adamancy you regard as cucks and wets and fence-sitters. How ironic then that I am the one determined to see you still able to call me that, no matter what. Take this recent Patreon calamity. We are seeing once again the credit card companies setting themselves up as censors. I say once again because they were already doing so years ago, enforcing their will upon the pornography sector. Another sector that realised that without money it was out of business, and as the credit card companies controlled the money, they were helpless to resist. In a virtual world, credit cards are money, so the credit card companies have form on this. They choose to interpret what they deem inappropriate use of their systems as a threat to their brand names, and so they act. And suddenly the all-American constitutional right to free expression melts away. Not merely are the social media platforms private property, but any form of payment system is private property also. All of a sudden you realise that the constitutional right to free speech is rather wafer-thin online. The private companies have it covered. It is within their right to crush any form of speech of which they do not approve. Capitalism at its finest. Huzzah! And so we have libertarians lecturing us all how the right to private property must not be touched. Instead, people in support of free speech should seek a market solution. The market solution being to build a new internet with new social media companies, aside from new credit card companies and a new international payment system. All to support that tiny minority online who are being booted from present systems. So no great challenge there then. The libertarians, who insist on setting private property above all, are of course completely wrong. So too are those left-wingers who are so possessed of hatred towards those who have been banned that they suddenly embrace libertarian aspects of capitalism to justify the attempts to silence political opponents. The truth is free expression has primacy here. Without it, there is no capitalism. There are no free market economics. There is no liberty. If you do not see that, you are a moron. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, even the Britisher can say such things. Because a centrist on the politics of the right and left gets his hackles up when it comes to curbing free expression and any justification thereof. The liberty of the individual is upon what our societies depend, more so than the liberty of individual companies to enjoy absolute freedom to operate as they wish. Yes, if companies start using their position of monopoly or oligopoly to operate in direct opposition to something as critical to Western society as free speech, then to my mind they lose all right to claim protection of their rights. Crush them, say I. Heavily regulate them. Or even break them up and force the parts to trade as individual companies, as one once did with Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Markets, capitalism, they are all good and well. But the reason we allow them free reign is not because of some religious belief that this is the only right way. No, it happens to be the best way of which we know. It is however not perfect, 
and monsters such as social media and credit card companies who take it upon themselves to prescribe speech can emerge. Markets and capitalism are there to serve the people and their nations. They are the most efficient way of acquiring wealth for the people and their nations. The people and their nations are sovereign, not capitalism and the markets. The purpose of it all, when all things are counted, are the people. For the people, of the people, by the people. And for anyone to think that it is in the greater interest of the people to have giant companies curtail people's speech is moronic. We have built our societies for the advantage and advancement of the people, not of the corporations. I say this as someone who believes in free markets, who believes government should be smaller, should stay out of people's business, as well as out of business itself. But this is not a case of petty regulation. Our world is becoming increasingly virtual, and so the agora is now a virtual one. So too money is becoming increasingly virtual. Companies should be perfectly free to operate as they see fit, to build structures and exploit them for profit. But the moment they set themselves in direct opposition to the interests of the people and to long-standing concepts of individual liberty, they ought to be dead meat. For I regard this action not as mere ill behaviour on the part of corporations. I regard it as a betrayal of Western values. A betrayal of our sacred liberties. A betrayal of our people. Whereas many of you more than likely think it is something they maybe ought not be doing. But then I'm not the one sitting on the fence here, am I? The wet. The diver. The centrist. So from one centrist to another, Happy New Year. That is all from the Sabbath Pass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.